Okay, this is video lecture number two for the makeup class for September 21st. So we are uh, now going to be covering the materials on federal rules 412 through 415. Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of these materials deal with the issue of sexual assault, which uh, we all know it has become recently an even more fraught area uh, in our society. Uh, right now there are a lot of people very concerned about uh, college sexual assault. Uh, there are people talking about what they refer to as rape culture in our society. And some people, including myself, are actually quite concerned about the possible uh, diminishment of due process for people who are accused of sexual assault, uh, in particular in this uh, more gray area of consent and what constitutes consent. Uh, in any event, I am very much appreciate how difficult these materials are uh, for many of us and uh, on the other hand though it's it's important to be able to talk about these issues in law school and I think people who are training to be lawyers hopefully are also uh, practicing what we preach in terms of trying to see all sides of every issue and make sure uh, that the law uh, proceeds in this area in a way that protects uh, the rights of everybody. Okay, on this slide uh, you see my favorite superhero, Wonder Woman. Uh, if you are not a comic book reader and you're not familiar with her, she's an Amazonian princess who's brought to the modern day to fight for justice and love and peace and sexual equality. Uh, she always has the goal of not just fighting against criminals, but actually reforming and changing them. Now, Wonder Woman was the invention of Dr. William Marston, who was a Harvard psychologist born way back in 1893. Uh, I find him interesting because he also uh, started, uh, he, he, he invented a, the very first systolic blood pressure measurement to use for lie detection. So basically, he invented the precursor to the polygraph uh, which is why Wonder Woman has a lasso, a rope that is always around her belt. Uh, that rope was supposedly made from the girdle of Aphrodite, the, uh, the goddess. And that's, that rope is also known as the lasso of truth. And when she wraps it around people, they have no choice but to tell the truth. Uh, so Marsden was definitely ahead of his time, was one of the first male feminists in the United States. He was actually convinced by his own psychological research that women were more honest, uh, more reliable than men, that they could work faster and with more accuracy. Now, Wonder Woman does have a shield, hence my idea for using her uh, on my first slide uh, to talk about the rape shield statute. Her shield actually itself doesn't have any significance that I know of. Uh, but her bracelets actually were purportedly made from Zeus's impenetrable shield. And after Zeus's father broke his shield into pieces, the goddess Athena apparently uh, took those pieces, made these br uh, bracelets to be given to the most worthy Amazon, uh, since the Amazons, of course, were the most fervent worshippers of those Greek gods. Anyway, uh, Wonder Woman's bracelets are unbreakable and they can deflect bullets, they can deflect bows with weapon, uh, blows with weapons, uh, but they also can form a force shield when she crosses them in front of her, which is why she does that sometimes. So again, uh, Wonder Woman actually an early feminist icon, so a good image to introduce the rape shield materials, I think. And by the way, if you're interested in learning more about uh, William Marston, uh, who also had a very unconventional 
home life. Uh, he had essentially two wives at home. This is a book written by Jill Lepore, who's a Harvard history professor, uh, that is supposed to be uh, a terrific book. Okay, so your book uh, hints, of course, at the very bad old days of rape prosecutions when defendants uh, could put a, a victim's reputation uh, and her specific acts on display in rape trials. Uh, so at common law, this was really terrible. Basically, uh, a rape victim's so-called character for chastity was freely admissible in rape trials uh, way back in the day. But in all honesty, it wasn't that much better up through the 1950s and 60s and 70s in this country. Uh, courts during that era allowed in evidence of a victim's sexual reputation, uh, sexual history, under some seriously Neanderthal hypotheses. Uh, some courts held, well, women who were quote unquote unchaste uh, were less credible. So they allowed the witness in uh, as witness impeachment. They said it's proper because uh, if a woman is unchaste, she's less believable. Uh, one court actually said in a written opinion that sexually promiscuous women were more likely to have rape fantasies and therefore were more likely to fabricate a rape charge. So across the country, prior to the time that jurisdictions had formalized evidence rules or these rape shield statutes, rape victims were very vulnerable to brutal cross-examination when they testified uh, because of that common law concept of allowing cross-examination to test the credibility of a witness. And it was also incredibly unpredictable. There was inconsistent application of those rules by judges in rape cases. Basically, how far attorneys were allowed to go with a victim witness's private life under the guise of supposedly attacking her credibility as a witness depended mostly on what judge you got. Uh, and most judges were not very enlightened up through uh, the 1970s. So the strong sentiment was uh, that we could not trust child trial judges to be able to handle this kind of evidence because history had actually taught us that they couldn't handle it. All right, but so we had our federal rules. They were enacted in 1975 uh, followed by, of course, a lot of states adopting similar rules. But this rape shield, uh, so-called rape shield rule, Rule 412, uh, was not, in fact, a part of the original set of federal rules. On the other hand, we did have Rule 404, uh, which, as you know, bars the use of someone's general character or reputation or the use of someone's specific acts to show that the person has a propensity to act in a particular way. So didn't Rule 404 therefore prohibit evidence about the sexual reputation or sexual history of alleged rape victims? Well, actually no, because remember the exceptions to Rule 404. The original formulation of 404 a to B actually allowed criminal defendants to offer evidence of an alleged victim's pertinent trait. And courts allowed evidence of a victim's character or reputation, say, for example, a woman's reputation as being sexually promiscuous under the theory that it was relevant to show likelihood she consented to any sexual contact. And although Rule 404B prevents the admission of past acts to prove propensity, it does allow admission if offered to prove something else. And some lawyers back in the day convinced judges to let in evidence that the victim had had sex with other people, for example, casual one night stands, by arguing that it showed intent under 404B, that it was a permissible purpose under 404B uh, to show that uh, the victim probably intended to have sex with the alleged perpetrator when she invited him up to her apartment because look, she had already had sex with all of these other guys before. And of course, remember that 
Rule 404B hints that there are other possible purposes not listed in the rule itself. So judges let in past acts for a number of ostensible reasons that they said didn't constitute character evidence. Now, feminist groups and prosecutors and law enforcement really lobbied for additional rule-based protections, uh, strenuously arguing that a victim's sexual reputation in a sexual assault case uh, or a victim's prior sexual history were irrelevant to whether the victim consented on the particular occasion at hand. Uh, whereas, on the other hand, allowing in this evidence could be incredibly prejudicial with juries. Uh, prosecutors wanted juries to not be vulnerable to becoming prejudiced against victims whose sexual activities maybe didn't line up with their moral codes. Uh, that, that whole idea, well, she was clearly asking for it. Mentality uh, was it's actually really prevalent in the public sphere back when these statutes were first proposed. So uh, federal rule um, 412 was added in 1978. So the federal rule 412 and then uh, the similar rules and state statutes that were passed in those years uh, pretty soon after 1978, they were passed with these uh, general purposes in mind. Number one, privacy concerns. Uh, we see when we look at these uh, rules and statutes that most uh, rape shield rules mandate certain procedures and require hearings in limine uh, after notice is given that possible excludable material is proposed to be presented. Uh, some uh, statutes and rules go so far as requiring in-camera hearings, uh, either in chambers or requiring clearing the courtroom uh, before these pretrial hearings about whether this uh, evidence uh, about victims could come in. And uh, goals number two and number three, uh, of course, increasing reporting of rapes and sexual assaults and increasing conviction rates, uh, those are, of course, somewhat related. Uh, victims had often been reluctant to put themselves through a rape trial with all that reputational mudslinging that went on. Uh, so they all, uh, often either didn't report at all or didn't want to go through with a prosecution once they found out uh, what they might be in for uh, in doing that. So Rule 412 and rules like it uh, try to strike a fair balance between protecting alleged victims uh, and, of course, allowing defendants to put on relevant evidence that might be exonerating to them. Okay, so Rule 412A prohibits evidence offered to prove that a victim engaged in other sexual behavior or evidence offered to show a victim's sexual predisposition for any purpose aside from the exceptions in Rule 412B. So I have some key phrases underlined here. At first, the rule only applied to criminal prosecutions, but it was expanded in 1994 to include civil cases as well. And remember that the rule only applies to cases involving alleged sexual misconduct. So if for some reason sexual history of someone was relevant in another kind of case, a witness couldn't use Rule 412 to exclude evidence or cross-examination about that. Uh, that said, uh, the phrase proceeding involving alleged sexual misconduct has been interpreted very broadly, for example, in civil harassment cases, for example, sexual harassment cases, the rule is in place uh, even for verbal harassment. So an alleged victim of verbal sexual harassment uh, can use this uh, rule to prevent um, you know, going into uh, his or her past uh, sexual behavior or sexual predisposition. Now, the exceptions to that general rule are there in 412B. So 412B1 uh, applies to criminal cases. 
uh, and that lists two specific exceptions uh, and then a third backstop protection for defendants. And then 412b2 applies to civil cases. Uh, most of the litigation on admitting this evidence centers on criminal cases. For, so, uh, so first, 412b1a permits evidence of sexual relations with persons other than the accused if and only if it is specifically offered to prove another source of some physical evidence, like the presence of semen or the presence of other physical injuries to a victim. Now, from a policy and logic standpoint, this kind of proof is very limited in time and purpose. Uh, in other words, whatever sexual activity is being presented would have to be shown to be very near the time of the alleged rape or sexual assault. So the idea is it would have only a minimal prejudicial effect against the victim since you're not allowed free reign to delve into the victim's general sexual habits or past. Now, I am not an expert in rape prosecutions, but I imagine that now with so much sophisticated DNA test testing available, there will be DNA testing done every time there's an allegation that a victim engaged in sex with someone other than the accused, at least when the rape was reported right away so evidence could be gathered. Now I have Kobe Bryant's picture here on the slide. Uh, this particular uh, exception, 412B1A, uh, did come up in the 2003 Kobe Bryant case where Bryant was charged with raping a hotel employee in his uh, hotel room. He claimed the sex was consensual, and at the preliminary hearing, the prosecution called a doctor who testified that he found cuts and abrasions in the victim's vaginal area that were consistent with forced sex. Uh, but on cross-examination, Bryant's attorney asked the doctor whether the injuries were consistent with multiple acts of consensual sex with different men over a short period of time, and then the prosecution objected to that question. Now, this case was in Colorado, so the judge there was applying the Colorado rule, but the question and the evidence was ruled to be admissible at the trial. The trial didn't end up happening though, because actually the victim decided not to go forward with the criminal case, although she did sue civilly and Bryant then settled that case out of court. Okay, next, Rule 412B1B allows a defendant to offer evidence of specific instances of a victim's sexual behavior with him with the person accused to help prove consent if that is the defense, if consent is the defense. Now this one is more controversial and problematic. It could be argued to have minimal probative value in fact as well. Courts have allowed in evidence of all kinds of intimate contact uh, between a victim and a defendant under this exception, not just prior sex. Uh, they've allowed in even uh, statements that the victim purportedly made about the defendant. The advisory committee notes here uh, even set forth the suggestion that sexual behavior under this exception could include statements in which the alleged, alleged victim expressed an intent to engage in sexual intercourse with the accused uh, or voiced sexual fantasies involving the specific accused. Uh, there's a Kentucky case uh, that I have on the slide, Commonwealth versus Young, in which a woman claimed that a police officer raped her after pulling her over for a traffic violation, whereas the officer claimed that she had flagged him down on his way home from work, after which they had consensual sex. That was his defense. The appellate court there upheld the trial court's admission of evidence that the alleged victim had come to the police station several times to flirt with this particular officer and admitted testimony of her friend that she wanted to, as the appellate court put it, engage in sex with Young to such a degree that it would melt the ice in the water cooler. 
Now, the prosecutor here tried to argue that those actions or fantasies had nothing to do with the actual incident here since she did not act on them at the time, but the evidence was nevertheless admitted. Remember, though, that these first two exceptions here in 412B, 412B1A uh, and 412B1B, uh, only allows the evidence in if the probative value is not substantially outweighed by the possible prejudicial effect. Okay, so both of these two exceptions are subject to Rule 403 balancing. Okay, so lastly, 412B1C allows any evidence to be admitted by a defendant in this context if the Constitution mandates it, if excluding it would violate the defendant's constitutional rights, such as the due process right or the right to confront witnesses uh, that is there in the Sixth Amendment, uh, Sixth Amendment's Confrontation Clause. So this is sometimes referred to as the constitutional catch-all part of this rule. Uh, anything admitted under this exception is going to be subject to classic constitutional balancing and not Rule 403 balancing, uh, which we're going to talk about in a minute. So it's a little bit of a different um, animal here. Now, this exception has been allowed to be used to present evidence that an alleged victim has made prior false claims of sexual assault. Prior false claims of sexual assault. The advisory committee note actually says you don't even need an exception to Rule 412 to admit prior false allegations of a victim uh, because the advisory committee said those are not actually sexual behavior. Uh, but some courts have relied on this rule this part of the constitutional exception anyway when letting that evidence in. Another common way this exception is invoked is to try to show that an alleged victim manufactured a rape claim to protect an existing relationship like we saw in both the Olden and Platero cases in the reading in the book. Now in both of those cases the Sixth Amendment a confrontation clause was implicated because the defendants wanted the right to cross-examine the alleged victims about their romantic relationships with people they were having affairs with because those individuals had in fact wit witnessed the victims in situations where it might have been obvious that the victims had had sex with the defendants. Uh, one other way uh, this exception though has been used is pretty outrageous. Most courts have rejected it saying it basically eviscerates the whole purpose of rape shield rules, but a few uh, courts have allowed it, and that is defendants who have proffered evidence of an alleged victim's promiscuity or reputation of promiscuity to help prove that the defendant reasonably believed that the victim consented to sexual contact. So, uh, in, in other words, to prove the defendant's state of mind as it relates to his intent. Now, the vast, vast majority of courts have rejected this uh, for obvious reasons because it's really just an end around um, the exception. I just wanted to put it in there that a very few courts have actually stretched this rule um, to allow that. So as I said before, uh, when we're talking about this last exception, this uh, constitutional catch-all exception in Rule 412B1C uh, for uh, allowing defendants uh, to put on uh, evidence if the Constitution mandates it. Uh, evidence admitted under uh, this particular aspect of the rule is not subject to Rule 403 balancing and in, instead uh, is subject to constitutional balancing because it is a uh, rule that specifically refers to the Constitution. It's, to me, kind of ironic. There, there are critics out there uh, that actually claim that, that this part of Rule 412 has a defect in that it's not protective enough of defendants' constitutional rights, uh, you know, because of this um, lack of a Rule 403 balancing. 
and uh, instead constitutional balance, balancing. Uh, I, like I said, think that's kind of ironic when, in fact, the, the rule itself explicitly calls for a constitutional analysis. So just to review what constitutional balancing entails, uh, here, um, you know, when you've got a constitutional issue, you're going to be balancing the defendant's right here, wh whether it's due process or right uh, of confronting witnesses, um, against the government interest, right? Uh, constitutional balancing uh, involves a, a government uh, action against the government's interest that's at stake, which here, of course, is probably going to include protecting victims and being able to secure convictions for rape if we want to look at what is the government interest here. So some people argue that this kind of constitutional balancing analysis, uh, we see it in action in the Olden case and in the Platero case. Some people say, well, this is less certain than the rules-based test under Rule 403. They say, oh, this is, a, this is a lot more fuzzy, this constitutional balancing. It's a lot more fuzzy and unclear. I personally think that's probably a debatable uh, point since, frankly, the 403 factors are arguably just as fuzzy. Uh, certainly, they are uh, just as unpredictable in their application by judges. Uh, and I think the other thing worth pointing out here is that having the balancing be constitution-based actually changes the nature of the appellate review. Remember, under Rule 403 and the other basic evidence rules, uh, the standard on review is abuse of discretion. Uh, but under the Constitution, if constitutional balancing has been done, it's a de novo standard. Uh, de novo means that uh, the appellate court actually can uh, really look uh, at all of the issues itself, rather than just looking at whether the judge abused his or her discretion. So the de novo standard plus the fact that constitutional rights are at stake in this uh, third exception here in 412 probably means that an appeal on an admissibility decision uh, that the defendant is arguing implicates his constitutional rights is going to be taken more seriously and, and frankly is probably less likely to be found to be harmless error um, if an appellate court thinks uh, a mistake was made by a trial court. Okay, next, I just wanna talk briefly about Rule 412 in the civil context, uh, and this is covered by Rule 412B2. Uh, so here's the rule. In a civil case, the court may admit evidence offered to prove a victim's sexual behavior or sexual predisposition if its probative value substantially outweighs the danger of harm to any victim and of unfair prejudice to any party. The court may admit evidence of a victim's reputation only if the victim has placed it in controversy. So, First off, don't get confused here and think that any and all reputation or past sexual activity is admissible in civil cases subject only to this probative value balancing. Uh, Rule 404's uh, prohibition of reputation and past acts to show propensity still bars that evidence most of the time in civil cases. But defendants in civil cases might try to offer evidence of a plaintiff's sexual history or reputation for similar purposes that are allowed under the criminal case exceptions, like evidence of past sexual activity or flirtatious activity between the plaintiff and the defendant. So I have a couple of case examples here, uh, one alleging workplace sex discrimination and rape, and one alleging verbal sexual harassment. Now, in neither of these cases was the defendant's proffered evidence allowed. So the first one, BKB versus Maui Police Department, here the plaintiff alleged sex discrimination and said, uh, she was a police officer, and said that other officers displayed pornography at the station and made lewd comments to her, uh, but she also alleged that the deputy police chief raped her three times telling her that if she reported it, no one would believe her and her career would be over. 
Now at trial, the police department here wanted to put on testimony from another officer that the plaintiff had modeled lingerie for him and had verbally come on to him after a party at her house. Uh, this was offered supposedly to try to prove that the plaintiff expressed her sexuality in ways that welcomed the kind of treatment she was alleging. Uh, but both the trial court and the appellate courts here agreed that this evidence clearly violated Rule 412 and didn't have enough probative value to outweigh the potential harm to the plaintiff. And in the next case, uh, Sox Bruno versus Hirschvogel Incorporated, the plaintiff there claimed that her supervisor created a hostile work environment with repeated lewd comments and requests that uh, forced her to resign. Uh, she also presented evidence that when she and another woman complained to the president of the company, he created a new sexual harassment program, but made the supervisor who harassed them the contact person to receive complaints under that program. Uh, now, the defendant company here tried to put on evidence that the plaintiff had an affair with another employee, uh, also that she had asked a female colleague what her opinion of fellatio was, uh, that she frequently used profanity, including the F word and the B word, uh, and also testimony of a co-worker who thought the plaintiff had flirted with the supervisor. Now, at first, the trial court allowed all this evidence in, uh, but then, in fact, after the trial was over, the trial judge decided that he should not have let it in. So he actually granted her a completely new trial. So we saw in those two cases that the courts were pretty strict in excluding the proffered evidence. Uh, but I want to go back to the text of the rule, uh, the civil rule here, um, to point out something that some of you might have just skimmed right by, thinking it was exactly the same as Rule 403, because it mentions probative value and unfair prejudice. But I want you to notice that the operative phrases are different. 412b2, again, which applies to civil cases, says that a court can only admit evidence of a victim's sexual behavior or predisposition if its probative value substantially outweighs the danger of harm to the victim and unfair prejudice to a party. So this is often referred to as the reverse 403 test because it does change the balance. Now here I have both rules on the slide just to highlight the difference for you. Remember with 403, evidence can only be excluded if its probative value is substantially outweighed by a danger. So in other words, with rule uh, 403, the evidence is, the, is sort of more likely to be admitted, right? Because the dangers have to substantially outweighed. Uh, but with 412b2, the evidence, the, the default is this evidence shouldn't come in, and it only can come in if its probative value substantially uh, outweighs uh, any danger of prejudice or harm. So I like to illustrate the difference uh, between these rules by actually imagining a piece of evidence whose probative value is going to be judged to be exactly equal to its danger of harm or prejudice. Okay, let's just imagine we have some piece of evidence and you look at it and you say, oh, probative value seems really equal to the danger of harm. What would happen under the two rules? Well, under rule 403, that evidence is going to be admitted because the 403 danger doesn't substantially outweigh the probative value. But evidence that was equal on both sides, probative value and danger of prejudice, <coughs> excuse me, would actually be excluded under Rule 412b2, right? Because in order to even to get admitted under that rule, probative value has to substantially outweigh prejudice. Uh, so again, we can see that the limitation here in the civil context, 412b2, really errs on the side of excluding this kind of evidence about a victim, uh, whereas 403, in comparison, uh, where that rule applies, errs on the side of admitting. Um, so I'm making a big deal about this. We are actually going to see this reverse 403 test again at the end of the semester when we talk about using criminal convictions to impeach a witness. Uh, in that context, 
uh, we're going to see if a qualifying conviction is more than 10 years old, this rule also is going to come into play. So we're going to see that if somebody has an older criminal conviction, the, the rule tends to err uh, also on the side of excluding those uh, convictions for impeachment of witnesses. Um, so anyway, I've got that here on the slide, the reverse um, the reverse uh, 403 rule, so that later when you're studying, you'll be able to connect those up. All right, that is the end of uh, video lecture two.